Hey there, YouTube. This is Robert with Reading Through History coming at you with another episode of Civil War Talk. And of course, check out my hat. And, of course, I'm coming at you as always from the uh, farting couch. So if you hear any noises, it's the couch. It's not me. But I did have a slight change in background. Check out here. Got the latest addition to my collection. It's, well, you laddies. I got to me an Irish Brigade flag. Of course, now that I've lost every single subscriber I have in Ireland, yeah, it's really, really nice. I am, of course, a poor high school classroom history teacher, so I cannot afford you know, the Mort Kunstler paintings or the artwork of Don Troiani or the sabers and you know, revolvers and muskets and stuff that guys who have money can actually collect. I have to buy the little $3 flags off of... Uh, you know, off of Amazon. But, uh, I guess you could consider this good news. When I was on there buying the Irish Brigade flag, I saw something. I saw, there are Confederate battle flags on Amazon. I know there's not supposed to be, or at least that was the, uh, hell, there, after the whole Dylan Roof thing, you know, they were pulling all that stuff down, and you couldn't buy so they were taking it out. There were even crazy stuff like books that had the Confederate flag on the cover. So I'm not sure they're supposed to be there, but I saw them there, and uh, you could order them. So anyway, to the main point, uh, the last episode of Civil War Talk that I did, I mentioned an interesting study that I found on PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and Civil War soldiers. And I promised I would get back at some point with that. So here it is. Uh, I hope I don't bore you to death. I will try not to just sit here and read this stuff because I know that can get tedious even if you are interested in the topic. But I found it quite fascinating and I couldn't, of course, use all of the information. So I was like, well, I'll come back to it later. So it's called Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder in the American Civil War. A reappraisal. It's by a guy named Daniel Clark, M.A., so I guess that means he has a Master's of Arts in History or something. But he starts off mentioning this article that was written back in 1996. And it appeared in History Today by a guy named John Talbot. And there's a quote here that says, The evidence bearing on combat trauma in the Civil War is anecdotal, ambiguous, and fragmentary says that the only evidence to trace post-traumatic stress disorder you know, comes from personal letters and diaries, because they didn't keep records on this type of stuff. So, this guy was like, he wrote this article, and he says there's no official documentation, which I find this stuff kind of odd, because I mean, he, what he is saying, I guess, was true at the time. It's like, hey, we don't have any evidence on this. They didn't keep records on it. So... Hospitals, government records, none of that stuff show that there's any proof that Union and Confederate soldiers experienced this. Well, I guess okay, but that's just because at the time they didn't have something called post-traumatic stress disorder. So what this paper is, it's just uh, this Daniel Clark going out and trying to find evidence that this stuff existed. Now, I have no doubt in my mind it did exist. We just didn't have a name for it at the time. Because, you know, going through the trauma of the Civil War, I mean, my God, I cannot even fathom. You know, no one alive today can imagine how horrifying that war must have been. So obviously people did experience I mean, if humans haven't changed that much since then, if people are going through it now, they certainly went through it during the Civil War. So. This paper's all about the research this uh, guy did, going and finding this stuff and bringing it up. And, of course, I I just found it fascinating because this, until very recently, has not been a very heavily researched topic. So, the author here states, There is a large amount of evidence to show that PTSD did exist in the mid-19th century. Like I said, it's not like it, it didn't. I mean, it's almost ridiculous to even think that it didn't. I mean, 
you know, you see it in, you see it in letters and diaries and documentaries and stuff that you watch. You know, they would usually call it like, uh, haunted by the war. <laughs> there were the guys that couldn't sleep through a night. I mean, I've seen tons of those stories. And there's some of them mentioned in here. Like I said, that's why it's so fascinating. That's why I hope not to bore you to death before I actually get to the good stuff. But there was a quote here that said, that really struck me and it was, Every man has his breaking point. Yeah, that sounds pretty sinister, doesn't it? Every man has his breaking point. So, we fast forward here, he's talking about research in the aftermath of the Second World War. You know, those men and women who went off and served in World War II and came back, and we call them our greatest generation, and that was like America's finest hour, you know, the 40s and the 50s. And all of our, you know, they were probably the best cared for group of veterans we ever had. As you see the horror stories with the VA and stuff today. You know, those guys, they were our heroes. We wanted to take care of them. And the medical, psychiatry, all this stuff, research, it was just blossoming and blooming and building. And that's where this phrase, every man has his breaking point, came from. And they were really starting to look into, like, the exposure to the horrors of battle. And it could cause even the most physically fit recruit. You could be 18, 19 years old in perfect physical condition. You could have all the machismo in the world. But every single one of those guys has a breaking point. Something can push them over the edge. And they called it mental implosions. And it was during World War II when they started to realize we cannot really keep these guys up at the front line constantly, all the time, fighting the enemy. I guess, of course, unless you're Russian or German. But the American doctors were like, this has a really big impact on these young men. We cannot do that. And they started noting that getting away from the front lines, getting some rest, mentally, not just physically, is like essential to the well-being of our soldiers. And of course now in the West we use this uh, all the time. You know, you don't just send guys off like you would in the Civil War. I mean, there were some guys, you know, if you went through the whole war, you may not, I know there were guys in the Army of Tennessee never even got a furlough in the entire time they were involved in the war. Uh, so that currently the British soldiers serving in Afghanistan, you know, they'll send them over there for six months at a time. But even during that six months that you're there, you're not always out in the dangerous Taliban territory. They rotate them in and out to uh, Camp Bastion. So imagine what it would be like serving for four years without ever getting a break. Now, obviously, they weren't fighting all the time unless it's the last year of the war in Virginia. You know, that was pretty much constant every day with Grant attacking Lee nonstop. I cannot imagine the impact that must have had on the soldiers of both armies. But this paper, as I found it interesting, because, you know, when I was th thinking post-traumatic stress disorder, I'm like, yeah, the shell's going off, the senior buddy get his head lobbed off, you know, running someone through with the band, you know, knowing you killed some, that kind of stuff. They were just talking about the day-to-day -day trauma of living in camp life. You know, being so far away from home, not seeing your family. I mean, imagine having young wife and children and getting sent off down to Virginia to fight and seeing companion, just getting sick and suffering there in the camp. Like I said, even during the times you weren't fighting. So this mentioned the daily hardships and said most of these Civil War soldiers, most of them... And we were still a very rural society. If you lived down in a rural society, yeah, you probably grew up under your father's hard thumb. But you got to be an adult. You There wasn't really any, you didn't deal with like government authority and people having that level of control over you, the officers and the military would. And you had a big degree of independence. And you were probably very close to your family. You probably grew up with, you know, there were 12, 13 kids in a family back then. And you didn't have that strict discipline that you would see in that regimented life of the war. And, of course, once you got sent away, you weren't seeing your family anymore. 
other than just like intermediate contact with letters and stuff back and forth. So he mentioned this book. Uh, someone had actually done research on soldiers who committed suicide during the war, like while they were fighting. I guess you would be, you know, you'd go off to the train or something and kill yourself, or you're out on picket duty, and you would just kill yourself intentionally. It's called Soldier Suicides in, the, in America's Civil War. And this is a quote, The rigors and boredom of camp life, intermingled with horrors of war and time, the nostalgia for home slowly took hold. Now this reminded me of a quote that I heard about playing poker once. Not that I want to compare fighting in the Civil War to playing poker, but they said, yeah, I read in a book one time when, I, when the poker craze was going on. It said, poker, to be a good poker player, you have to get used to hours and hours of boredom, followed by about 20 seconds of sheer terror. <laughs> That's what life was like for a Civil War only, you know, soldier only, it was weeks, maybe months and months of boredom, and then one day of sheer terror. You know, during the battle. Because, you know, you might fight five or six days of the year. It's probably 360 days a year of sitting in camp or just marching and drilling and training. That alone is going to cause massive amounts of depression. Of course, we know today depression can be a serious mental illness. I mean, when we see the numbers of people that take their own lives just from this massive amount of depression that we have. So even the act of marching said marching could drive you crazy. I've read a lot just about the rhythmic you know, marches and stuff, like uh, the Army of Tennessee when they were on the uh, Nashville campaign. Just the marching, 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 and men would actually get to the point where they could like fall asleep while they were marching. Or you just look at the guy in front of you, either his uh, feet or his head, and you would just like go into this daze. Or you would just like be like, you weren't even conscious of what you're doing. I know I do that driving sometimes. And thank goodness we have a subconscious, right? You know, we would all be dead. No one would survive a car trip anywhere. It's not like driven through towns and stuff and don't even remember doing it, stopping at the stoplights or anything. But how about the act of marching causing trauma? And did say that military, so, you know, military surgeons during the Civil War did start recognizing this type of stuff. You do see evidence of it in their notes and their journals and talking about keeping the army hydrated. And the heat stroke. And I mentioned the heat stroke where soldiers would just collapse from the marching ranks and die from exhaustion. And that even just going through a collapse and almost dying or something like that had a serious impact on some of these guys who survived, you know, a minor case of a heat stroke. So in the most serious cases, they said some of these guys would go into, like, epileptic-like fits and sometimes even die. And they said this is very important because of the way Civil War armies were composed. You were in a company, and your company came from your same county or sometimes even village or town. You knew all of the men in your company. So if you actually saw, like, your best friend or some... One from your town, you know, an uncle collapsed and died just on the march. You know, because you kind of get used to people getting shot and dying after a while. But, you know, if you lose a close childhood friend in a situation like that, it can be pretty traumatizing. So then, of course, the big one's the stress of battle. And this is where I saw some of these stories were just amazing. You see the death and the maiming of your comrades. This is going to cause a serious mental trauma for almost everybody. And you could go either way. You could completely break down, go into a shell. Uh, you could just go into that. You never talk to anybody. You could go flat out crazy. You could turn into a psychopathic killer. So they said even the battle-hardened soldiers, before a fight could start, you kind of had that sense in the air of, this one's going to be bad, or you knew when it was going to be a really, like Antietam or Gettysburg or something like that. And there's plenty of cases of soldiers snapping before the battles even started. Like I said, even the veterans. Uh, it quoted one veteran as saying, the real test comes before the battle. Just because you've got all that adrenaline, you've got the fear, you've got the anticipation, it's just building, I and mean, you could just feel it in the air, and you knew 
when this battle was coming. Another soldier said, I was faint. A glance along the line satisfied me that I was not alone in my terror. Many men had a p pale face, livid expression of fear. And then they said once the battle, of course, got started, that fear kind of goes away. It's kind of like before you play a big basketball game, a football game, if anyone's ever been involved in one of those, you know, you've got that nervous. But once it starts and it gets going, it all changes. Sometimes it can take a minute, two minutes. You get hit once on the field. You're, they talk about that with rookie quarterbacks all the time. Then it escalates in a civil war battle from that fear to anger and rage. And they quoted this uh, 12th Michigan infantry soldier saying, When George Gates was shot, I was so enraged, I could have tore the heart out of the rebel if I could have reached him. And another story they told was just of a young boy trying to be brave, and he was. Uh, talked about a group of Mississippi soldiers who were breaking in battle, and the men were kind of falling back. They mentioned a young boy soldier. His actually there was showing the bravery. He was trying to get the men to rally and go back into the fight. It said he had tears just rolling down his face. Just the sheer levels of emotion. You got the fear. You got the anger. You got the rage. You got the sheer terror. And the next phase of this talked about the atrocities that men committed. And, of course, during the Civil War, it was absolutely brutal. And there are many instances, you know, there weren't like the Geneva Convention Accords and all that stuff back then, you know, the rules of war where they're like, oh, that's what you can do and cannot do. They didn't have rules like that. So, of course, this immediately went to the Fort Pillow Massacre. And, of course, Fort Pillow will be one of those things at some point I would actually like to do a Civil War talk just about Fort Pillow because you get some conflicting you know, stories on that. But we do know that there were Confederate soldiers there that almost certainly went over the line, and they killed large numbers of Union soldiers after they tried to surrender. So apparently there was a subsequent engagement after Fort Pillow. And I'm guessing one of the Confederate soldiers who participated in the massacre, if that's what you want to call it, at Fort Pillow, Got a tattoo of it. You now somehow noted that, hey, I was at Fort Pillow. So I guess he was proud of it. Well, this guy got captured by Union soldiers later. In fact, this is the story that kind of made me like, huh, I want to come back and do a video about this because it's pretty just awing. So it says that they captured this Confederate soldier that had this uh, tattoo commemorating Fort Pillow. And it said, as soon as the boys saw the letters on his arm, they yelled, no quarter for you. And a dozen bayonets went right into him. Now the guy who noted this said, I shall never forget his look of fear. I can imagine. That's about as bad a way to die because, you know, a bayonet, it's like a two or three foot long, essentially knife that you stick on the end of a musket. Can you imagine being banned just with one, but much less 12 of them? Another Union soldier was so affected by what he had done to enemy prisoners after he captured them that he carried the scars with him until his dying day. So for the rest of this guy's life, even when the war was over and he went back home, wherever he was from up there in Yankee land, that he was scared to death that the Confederates were trying to kill him. That the Confederates were sent these spies up north to hunt him down and kill him. So it said this guy would take his gun, he would take his blanket, and he would go hide out in the woods for days and days at a time. That this like became normal routine for him. That he didn't feel safe at home. That these guys were going to come and kill him. And he was like, I've got to escape him. I've got to escape him. And he would go out and essentially just hide out in the woods. And then, of course, prison life. The Civil War is one of those wars where if you actually got captured by the enemy and they sent you off to a prisoner of war camp, you were probably less likely to survive 
than you were if you were actually out in the field fighting people. Because you're locked and confined in one area, just the conditions living there and the diseases and such were rampant. But then the boredom, and all of these places were ill-equipped. I mean, you know, the, the Confederate prisons, they get all the, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They get all the bad press in places like Andersonville, which was by far the worst in the entire war. But even the ones up north, I mean, they were always squalid, ill-equipped, and you were just stuck there. Thousands and thousands and thousands of guys confined in one area for a very long period of time. Rain, snow, sleet, and hell. The latrine there. I mean, the diseases just... Oh. If you were stuck in one of these military prisons, it was very stressful. And you had no idea how long you were going to be there. Especially after Grant stopped trading prisoners. Like, if you were a Yankee prisoner in 1864 after Grant took it, you were just stuck. You know, good luck surviving Andersonville. But I mean, yeah, Libby, Elmira, Point, look at all these places. There's just horrible stories coming out of these places. So, all of these people who noted, you know, took note of their experiences in a prisoner of war camp mentioned time and how slowly time moved. You know, if you think Time moves slowly in six or seventh hour history class at the end of the day when you just want to go home. Imagine being in a prisoner war camp for over a year. Or even, oh, six months or a month. It would be horrible. So to pass time, you did whatever you could. You would sit there and you would tell stories. You would reread every single newspaper you had. Just reread it over and over again. Every letter that you had from loved ones, just go over it time and time again. And it talks about people in these prisons literally going insane. I mean, I can only imagine how frequent this must have been. And talked about how they were just the ones who still had some of their mental faculties about them, because everyone handles these types of situations differently. You've got some soldiers, though, who completely snap, and they just, they want it over with. They actually just get up and they walk out to, you know, all of these places. They had the walls around the prisons. And then they had the no-go zone, like the kill zone. It was like these markers that you would not go past them or you would be shot because they didn't want any people approaching or rushing the walls. So, they called it the deadline. So some people would just decide, I can't take it anymore, and they would stroll out there just to get shot and hope they would die. But then others would just start meandering around. They didn't have their senses about them, and they don't even know that they're going into an area where they're not because your, your mind is just shot. So tons of mental problems that it talked about. And here there's an admission to the Indiana Hospital for the Insane. They talked about this guy who had been in a prison camp that said he just continually and incoherently rambled about the war, experiences that he had, and his religion. So sometimes you didn't break down during the war, it was after the war. And you could have uh, experienced it, lived through it, certainly it changed you, but then it's over. You finally get sent home. Sometimes it can be years before this stuff really starts catching up and haunting you and tormenting you. I mean, I know I just experienced nothing this traumatic, but there's stuff that happened in my childhood that still deeply troubles me and bothers me. And it was nowhere near this. And we're talking like simple things like dropping a bowl of spaghetti or something like that. And, you know, your brother's like, you're ready to do it. And your mom's like, oh. And you're just like, oh, because you feel like, oh, I ruined the family meal. You know, <laughs> I can still remember that. And it's nothing compared to what these guys went through. So, next thing that I have highlighted here, 1,300 years before the Civil War, the ancient Greeks, they did recognize mental illness. You know, they took note of it. They, you know, I can imagine the doctor, Hippocrates and those guys, they were aware of this stuff. And at the time of the Civil War, they basically had three different kinds of mental illness that was recognized. And the first one was mania. 
That's where the word maniac would come from. It's described these people as being agitated and anxious. Their symptoms not attributed to a physical illness. So, like, you could get a disease like yellow fever or malaria, and if you started losing some of your mental faculties after that, they wouldn't categorize you as a maniac. A maniac was someone that it was completely, it was just a mental, mental issue. Then there was dementia. And this, of course, the gradual decline of your mental capabilities where if someone knew you and they were around you, they could see it breaking down systematically. You see this a lot with people who are aging. And then they had one called melancholia. And this is a person who, everything I read about, it kind of seemed like today would be a person who was suffering from depression. So, Officially, at the time of the Civil War, and this is where it kind of starts getting interesting because you can compare this to World War II. I said, I hope I'm not boring people because I found this very interesting. Uh, doctors were somewhat trained and told at the time of the Civil War to recognize mental illness. And early in the war, they, of course, watched for this way closer than they did later in the war. Early in the war, when Lincoln said 30,000, and everyone thought this was going to be over in three months, yeah, they looked at recruit, recruits pretty tough. They actually sent guys home. And the no's are, we don't need you, or you're, you're not qualified. But of course, as the war went on, and it just got worse and worse and deadlier and deadlier, and the death toll was up in the hundreds of thousands, uh, you were having the draft riots, you know, there were literally people trying to avoid even getting drafted. Uh, they started kind of overlooking a lot of this stuff. So early, they might overlook you. Uh, if you had some sort of mental breakdown, they might discharge you. Uh, and they said, you know, if you manifested signs of insanity or mental trauma. And, of course... Some of them would be sent, if you had the mental breakdown or whatever in the war, they usually wouldn't send you home. They would send you to a mental asylum or something like that. So, yeah, you might escape the fighting, you know, if you wanted to fake it, but they might very well send you to a mental asylum. But, talked about here, uh, if evidence was heard, because this is what they would do, you know, if you, uh, they thought you had, like, a mental issue or something. Like I said, they did recognize this stuff. Uh, they would bring up three doctors who would basically look at you. Uh, your fellow soldiers, your friends would come in and they would testify on your behalf. And through this, you could actually be a release from military duty. But they did talk about the court-martials and stuff being sent out and how this was generally hastily organized. They didn't have a lot of time to mess around with this, not to mention the, like I said, understanding of it all. So it was kind of hard to get out of it because a lot of times they would think you were faking it. A lot of times they would, like I said, if you really did mental breakdown or something, you were going to an insane asylum. There really wasn't a lot of thin line between, oh, he's in such bad shape that he can't be in the, he can't be in the army, but we're going to send him home, type thing. I said, that seemed to be pretty rare. And the more that they needed the men later on, as the war went on, they were like, yeah, he'll be okay, you know, tough it out, quit being a coward or whatever. Not to mention the fact, like I said earlier, you're in there with your friends, you were in there with people from your community, you didn't really want to be seen as a coward. But... Uh, this paper did talk about how both the Confederate and the Union, you know, the Northern governments, did create systems during the war to deal with serious trauma. So regimental surgeons could actually send, uh, and I already kind of mentioned this, they had government hospitals. They had one for insane soldiers in Washington, D.C., I cannot imagine what it must have been like being around there, being incarcerated there, working there. I mean, these were guys that literally snapped. I mean, they went mentally insane. Now, something happened in that war. They saw or experienced something. They went insane. 
Now, during the entire conflict, there were only about 1,200 men sent there. But you figure at any one given time, you know, the Union Army in Virginia, the Army of the Potomac, normally numbered somewhere around 100,000 to 120, 140,000 men. So that could be, you know, at any given time, that's, what, 1%? You're thinking probably how many served during the entire war. Probably 250,000. So, yeah, it's still, I mean, it's a fair number that totally went gone. But usually it said uh, if you were, uh, like in the South, they didn't have anything like that. So they relied on their nearest mental hospitals. And apparently, you know, every state had them. Usually they would fall in some military district. Uh, you would be sent to a mental hospital or asylum depending on what state you were in. Uh, so, of course, you see this with the Confederacy all the time. So we got the number 1,200 for the Union. said, no way of knowing how many Confederate soldiers were affected by this uh, during the years of the war, but it mentioned if you were, like, in the Deep South, uh, like if you're down there in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, I mean, what would happen like if one of Sherman's men, while they were marching through Georgia, went insane? Apparently, they sent them to uh, the state mental asylums as well. I kind of found that interesting. So, both sides said, yeah, a soldier can mentally break down. They do need uh, medical care. And it's not just if you're physically injured. So, it mentioned here, President Abraham Lincoln's Surgeon General. Uh, he actually had notes about this. And he wrote a book called The Medical and Surgical History of the War of the Rebellion. So, he goes on to say, by the way, his name was Dr. William A. Hammond. He does actually mention PTSD in this book. But they called it nostalgia. I well, said... I started this off saying, because okay. I find it kind of weird to say, oh, there's no evidence of PTSD, not just because they didn't call it PTSD. You have to dig deeper. I mean, it was there, it is there, and Lincoln Surgeon General mentioned it. Uh, he called it nostalgia. In other places, you see it referred to as the soldier's heart. And they, by the way, these are terms I had heard before, particularly soldier's heart. Irritable heart syndrome. And, of course, even in more recent years, there's the DaCosta's Syndrome. It's actually named after Dr. Jacob Mendez de Costa, who discovered it during the Civil War. So it's like four or five different references there of things that could today qualify as PTSD. And, of course, they put these into the different categories of insanity. So, hospital records... They do exist from this era where they're saying, yeah, this person suffered from nostalgia. And today, as I said, that's kind of what you could refer to as PTSD. Uh, there's others that are mania. They said this guy is suffering from mania. A lot of those guys, it was PTSD. And, of course, there's the melancholia. So... There was a system of guidelines. Now, I kind of mentioned this earlier. Doctors were somewhat told to look out for this. They did have some standards. Uh, but by and large, as I said, they needed the soldiers. This was widely overlooked during the war. Now, I mentioned World War II. World War II is kind of like the opposite. Now, we needed way more men, larger armies, of course, larger populations in World War II. We know the scale of World War II. Not only that, the United States was fighting a two-front war. We're fighting the Germans, and we're fighting the Japanese. In World War II, they kind of took the opposite effect of this. They said, we're going to uh, get these guys out of the army. In other words, in World War II, they were like, oh, we want the best of the best. We want to maximize their efficiency. So, he put it this way. They cut loose what they called the ineffectives. Whereas the U.S. Army during the Civil War was like, we need as many soldiers as we can get. 
And of course, back then we had those notions. Not so much, you know, we really had it in the South. The whole courage and valor and duty and honor, but it existed in the North too. So like, we're not going to have any cowards or shirkers in our army. So if you showed any signs of that, you know, you might even be stood up and shot for cowardice or desertion. But, because if you just snapped and like ran away, that's all oh, you're deserting, you know, you could be shot. So, they would think, oh, he's just trying to escape the fighting. But, plus there were, I mean, he actually mentions here there were people who thought, yeah, they're faking this stuff and the surgeons. A, they weren't really trained to recognize whether or not you were actually suffering from mental illness. But then, of course, they thought, well, he might be trying to get out of fighting. So it was hard to tell in 1863 if it was a genuine case or not. Now, treatments. So we don't even really know how to provide these people proper help today with all the science and technology and health medicine that we have. You can only imagine during the Civil War. I mean, the guys who were legitimately just wounded, like grievously wounded on the battlefield, there wasn't a whole lot they could do for them. And that's the physical aspect of it. The mental aspect, they weren't trained for this type of stuff. So, as I've already said, usually you would end up in some sort of a mental hospital. Could be a state or a federal mental hospital. And... Originally, you, you were given all these strange potions and treatments and stuff. By the time of the Civil War, this was really improving. We took some pretty big leaps and bounds in there. And, uh, but at that stage of it, you were probably better off being sent home. But, you know, if your family couldn't really care for you, that's really the only place you could go. But, there are some regiments, some regimental doctors, that did take some pretty interesting notes on what they called nostalgia. And they even found, even at the time of the Civil War, there were some regiments that didn't have hardly any cases of this at all. And then there were other regiments where it was pretty prevalent. Now, is this one of those things where some guys see soldiers exhibiting these behaviors, they start mimicking it? Could it be a case where, hey... Johnny got out of having to fight, so I'm going to go try and fake it. Because, I mean, I actually you know, had an uncle in my family that got out of World War II. Not necessarily proud of it, but, you know, he actually, like, picked up a, you know, he faked being crazy. You know, picked up a uh, stick and rode it around like it was a horse making <laughs> noises. They're like, this guy is crazy. And I said, during World War II, they were weeding those guys out. There were cases of guys who faked it. So during the Civil War, obviously, you know, we had to stand in the middle of a field and fire at the enemy. There were people who probably tried to get out of it that way. So if someone saw one of their comrades get out of having to fight, yeah, I guess they could have faked it, tried to get out. Uh, so I don't really know what that could be. This paper kind of attributed it to morale and leadership. Like, if this unit had really high morale, if this unit had really charismatic leaders, good leadership that took care of and cared for the men, they had very few cases of this. Some regiments, like I said, not at all. But then the more I thought about it, I'm like, well, maybe that regimental doctor just wouldn't ever say, yeah, it's a case of nostalgia, and let someone out of it. Could be a mixture of all of these things. Uh, but apparently the regiments where they had the occupation of the mind, you know, this is a quote here, occupation of the mind was the tonic that relieved morbid preoccupations. I love how they called it mor morbid preoccupations. But what's interesting, I said now we have more research available on this than ever before, obviously. It's getting better. We're starting to understand it. They actually went and examined units from the 2003 Second Persian Gulf War in Iraq. You know, soldiers that were there from 2003 to 2008. They found very similar results. There were some units where there were a lot of cases of PTSD. There were other units where there were almost none at all. I found that interesting. How people just kind of... I said, I, I would like to know, is it... People see their comrades exhibiting it. They start mimicking it, maybe not knowing. 
Uh, could it be, I dare say there could be some people like, oh, this is a way to get some kind of attention. I don't know. Could it be like, we just had better morale. We had a, we had a better time there. You know, the unit, obviously units that suffered more, I think would be more prone to, because, you know, there were units over there never even had a shot taken at them, probably, because you see that in wars all the time. Uh, that was a combat unit. I would think they would be more prone to suffer from that. Okay, after the war, and when the dust had finally settled, thousands of veterans were out there. A lot of them, you know, 100,000 or more wounded. Uh, some of them grievously wounded, but then there's the mental injuries as well. So if you were a Union veteran, you at least got some help from the government. Some. Like I said, it wasn't great, but you got a pension. If you were a Confederate, there, of course, was no federal government pension. Some states eventually got around to giving them some money, but it was just a fraction of what the uh, Union veterans got. But if you had psychological trauma, now what would the government do for you? What would the government, what would your state do for you? Now, at first, it was just, you had to rely on your families. And, of course, if you had to take care of a husband, a father, a brother, this was very hard, very time-consuming, because during this era, particularly out in the rural areas, you know, you had to rely on the men's labor to survive. It was, like, essential. So if you had someone that was very distressed, was suffering from some sort of mental illness, uh... And I wonder if this, like, helped the prohibition movement any at all. Because it talked about there wasn't a lot of stuff for men to go to because they didn't have the medications and stuff back then. It talked about a lot of these guys turned to very copious amounts of alcohol. And, of course, this, some people, I mean, I'm sure everyone watching this has probably seen someone at some point in their life they get drunk, they get, like, aggressively violent. I mean, just, like, crazy. More aggressive toward their carers and their neighbors. And, of course, this would lead to more and more domestic abuse. Now, I tried to do a little bit of independent search out here on my own on the side. Did cases of domestic abuse go up in the late 1860s and the 1870s? Unfortunately, I ran into the wall that I feared I would. Not really any records on it that I could find. But I did see that during the 1870s, courts in the United States of America started in droves ruling against abuse by the husband against the wife. Because, you know, back in colonial America, they're all, oh, you could beat, a wa beat your wife with a stick as long as it wasn't bigger round than her thumb. I remember learning that in my colonial America an American Revolution class. So it did say that during the 1870s, courts did, across the country, really start ruling against husbands who physically abused their wives. And they were trying to keep women from being subjected to that kind of violence. Now, does that have anything to do with cases of it going up due to the Civil War? I don't know. I also saw that in Britain. Uh, the same thing was going on there. So there is that whole where we kind of correlate with Britain, you know, whatever movements are going on in Britain kind of pass over here, and whatever's going on over here pass over there, like the you know, women's suffrage movement and things like that. So I don't know. I really don't know, but talked about cases of assault and murders where Civil War veterans would get drunk, uh, would get in this depression, they would get drunk, they would go into a rage, they would abuse their spouse, they would assault someone, and in some cases they even murdered somebody. So, aye, aye. So, and of course the strange and peculiar behaviors. Talked about countless veterans not being able to sleep at night, I said that doesn't surprise me. Uh, severe cases of anxiety, uh, nervous injury, Talked about another guy, William H. Jewelly, who would wake up in the middle of the night, randomly, just like, he's like, oh, the Confederates are here. The Confederates are coming for me. This guy would grab a hatchet 
and a revolver. And he would go out, and he would start walking around his house. He would stroll out into his yard. He would go out and he would start walking around the community. This guy was hunting for Confederate agents that he thought were there to kill him. So apparently this just got worse and worse, and eventually the sheriff was called in. And the sheriff would have to restrain him and take the hatchet and the gun away. And apparently he had one of these episodes that was pretty bad. And he threatened to shoot one of his neighbors with his gun. Because I'm like, how could someone do this even once and they give his gun and hatchet back? But apparently he finally, like, threatened one of his neighbors. And the sheriff had to overpower him, take his gun, and restrain him with a rope. Who in the world would want to be a cop? Who in the world would want to be a sheriff? I cannot imagine, because you have to deal with that kind of stuff. So, eventually they start throwing these people in these mental hospitals. And as the decades pass, after the Civil War, more and more of these guys start ending up in there. And they're overwhelming these smaller asylum systems. Because, you know, like a county might have one asylum center... And as the years pass, these places just get filled up with these uh, Civil War veterans. So, th this did have some numbers. In 1861, there were 8,500 patients committed to these types of hospitals throughout the entire country. So, there were 8,500. By the time the war was over, it was 17,000. And in the next decade, it doubled. And then the next day, decade, it doubled again. And then the decade after that, it doubled again. And these places were just filling up with these Civil War veterans. And it talked about how you could be put in there for a very short period of times. Apparently, a lot of these places had policies. They wouldn't keep you more than like four months. So your family would have to send you there. You would get some kind of treatment. Probably not the best in the world. But then you would have to uh, come back. And once your condition would slightly improve, they would say, oh, he's better, and they would send him back home. And it was just like this cycle. You would come back home, you would be better than you were, you would decline, you would eventually go into that, you know, red alert state, and they would send you back. And it's about all these veterans that just, that was the rest of their life, going in and out of these asylums like that, just in mental hospitals. Now, they would never cure you, you would just be admitted two or three times throughout the course of a year. And I kind of put a note here. Does being around crazy kind of make you crazy? So I wonder about the people that were put in there that maybe they didn't belong in there. Maybe that wasn't the place for them. Because, you know, I I don't want to come across as make, you know have, making any fun of some of these examples of stuff I've seen, so I'm not going to mimic any of them, but you know the types of behaviors that people in these places would exhibit. Now, if you were just put in there and you were institutionalized with these people, I'm like, what would that do to you? So, it did talk about how care got better. Uh, they started working on what they called therapy, where they were like, hey, we're going to try and uh, help these people. And usually it just boiled down to giving them activities to do something to keep them busy. Be it cooking, be it cleaning, uh, designing, rehearsing, performing theatrical performances. They said they would have these people design their own plays, make their own uniforms, go out and perform them. You know, for the staff, uh, family members would be brought in to watch these performances. Uh, cooking meals for the other patients, uh, helping keep the wards and stuff clean like that. So the uh, pension system, it talked about that. Uh, it talked about how gradually more was done for people with mental trauma, uh, family and friends, to get you this type of help from the government. Because it talked about the United States government. At first it was just you had to have like a physical ailment, a physical injury from the war. But they eventually opened it up to mental issues as well. And you'd have to be interviewed. Your family would have to sign affidavits. Friends could fill them out as well. You'd be interviewed by a panel of doctors. And they, you could get up to $72 a month, which I imagine the late 
1800s, even some of these guys might have been alive, you know, and receiving this in the early 1900s. Uh, that's a pretty fair amount of money. Uh, the first year of the war, they already had 4,300 U.S. veterans receiving this pension, like from taking a serious injury the Battle of Bull Run or something like that, Wilson's Creek getting shot up. There are like 4,300 guys receiving this pension already. Prepare yourselves. 1902. The number of people that had received that pension surpassed 1 million. So what was it, like 2.75 million soldiers uh, in the Civil War? Thinking the Union Army, it was somewhere around one and a half, two million. The Confederates, it was like 800,000. So, this would only be the Union veterans, one million veterans receiving that pension. Now, if you were a Confederate, it's kind of up to your family to take care of you. Give you some kind of care and treatment, or you would get sent to the state. Okay. Eventually, they come up with the uh, state pension system. But the Confederates, there was, if it was a mental, mental suffering, didn't qualify. Uh, it was only for physical, uh, physical ailments. Uh, so nothing, of, no PTSD payment from uh, these southern governments. So, talked about soldiers' homes. I kind of mentioned that in the last video. Uh, but to be put in a soldier's home, you had to prove that you could not support yourself, that your family could not support or house you, and that you had no one at all that could help you. This is, again, in the South. Uh, so a lot of these guys, it said, ended up in the county poorhouses, just literally where the poor homeless people wound up, or a bunch of these guys ended up homeless. So the end conclusions in this paper, like I said, hopefully, I realize I'm going on close to an hour here. Hopefully, if you're still with me, I haven't bored you, obviously, if you are with me. <laughs> I mean, if you are bored, I don't know why you're still here, but... So there's no doubt PTSD did exist during the Civil War. There's all kinds of sources of evidence that there were mental illnesses, that the government authorities recognized these mental illnesses and acknowledged them, the military recognized and acknowledged it as well. And there were people out there campaigning for them. Dorothea Dix is one of them that come to mind. Now, she was trying to help the mentally ill before the war. She tried to help, help the uh, soldiers during the war. And, of course, during and after the war, the soldiers who suffer, suffered from mental and physical ailments. Uh, talk about moral treatments. Uh, there's evidence that people even in France in the 1780s, like pre and during the French Revolution, were talking about moral treatments for people uh, who were suffering from these mental issues. And of course, if you go back further and further in history, it's harder and harder and harder to find any evidence with PTSD. Before that, uh, and talk about the history of medical records and why it's so difficult to go back earlier than the Civil War. But during the Civil War, it got better, and it's only continued getting better since then uh, with the symptoms and the admission of these ailments. So it is there. Uh, so I just thought I would share that with you if you wanted to... Uh, you it, listen, watch, enjoy it. I found it, like I said, fascinating, so hopefully it didn't come across as too boring. I try not to just sit there and read, 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 read. But, like I said, I, it was kind of new to me. It was a topic I had you know, thought about kind of on the side, like, man, how would that affect you if you saw these battles and you're... But I was thinking just like, you know, living with the nightmares and stuff like that. Think about it, you know, just completely breaking a person down mentally like that. So, I can only imagine what the scope of the war, the number of men that fought in it, the stuff that they witnessed, the trauma that they went through, what that would do to a person. Uh, so, you just got to sit there and hope that the country never has to go through something like that again. But there's definitely no doubt 
PTSD was a real thing during the Civil War, and people did suffer from it. So, I will just cut it off there. If you like this, uh, if you like this, please like, comment down below. If you'd like to participate in future Civil War talks, I'd like to have panels where we just kind of sit there and talk about various things. I'm still planning on doing McClellan and Grant in Virginia next, even if I have to do it alone. I will because, you know, I've asked people about it, got some interesting you know, points pointed out, plus stuff that I myself have considered throughout the years. So I'll just kind of leave it at that. And uh, if you haven't subscribed and you want to see more Civil War Talks, definitely do that. And I'll catch you next time, probably with an episode about McClellan and Grant in Virginia. So until next time, I'm Robert, reading through history.